So we've talked in a previous lecture about how conserved the ribosome was. Um, and we've talked a little bit about how it may have evolved um, through deep time to become this more and more uh, complicated structure. But a more physical question that we could ask about the ribosome is how efficient or good is it at what it does? And so one perspective on that um, is this idea of Landauer's bound. So what Landauer's bound is in, in the physics community is a way of saying take a particular abstract computation and tell me what is the minimal amount of energy that any physical device could, could use to implement this abstract computation. And what that turns out to be, in a general sense, is Boltzmann's constant times temperature times the change in the entropy, um, the entropy over the course of this uh, computation. So the initial entropy at the beginning of the computation minus the final entropy after you've performed all the computations you care about. And so we can take the ribosome and use this perspective to say something about it. So what we have in an abstract computational sense is an unordered pool of letters that we're trying to write into one specific string. And so we can calculate the entropy of that unordered pool, and then we know the entropy of just a, a single string, a single state that we're writing to. And so you can see up above uh, the defined entropies given the probabilities of states in each of these two models um, and what that entropy would be. We then know the entropy change and we can calculate this Landauer's bound. Um, and what we find if we consider how many ATP are used to polymerize um, a single amino acid in total is that life is about 20 times less efficient than the physical limit. Now this may sound a lot, 20 sounds like a big number, and so the question is, well, does that mean we're very close to Landauer's bound or very far away? And for reference, modern human computers are about 100 million times worse than Landauer's bound. So life is doing a much better job, specifically ribosome, the ribosome is doing a much better job um, than even the best computers that we've made um, at performing this abstract computation of string writing. So as we mentioned in the previous lecture, one of our main interests is in understanding how we might take the central dogma and use it to, to learn something about the origins of life. Um, one way to gain information about that central dogma is to think about how it shifts um, in terms of, say, compositional ratios um, across the range of organisms. Um, and we can do that in bacteria. So some work that we've done has been to look at the range of bacterial sizes and to ask how the componentry of the central dogma is changing across bacteria of very different size. So in these plots, which are log-log, you'll see cell volume against the volume of a particular component, where the green line is simply the one-to-one -one line representing total cell volume. And what we've been able to show is that as cells become bigger, you require less and less volume for the DNA, which follows a power law. And at the small end, this, this DNA volume is taking up almost the entire cell volume. As you can see where this red line um, intersects this green line, and DNA is roughly 50% of the, the total cellular volume. Turning to proteins, we find that they also follow a power law across all of bacteria. Again, at the small end, they're taking up a huge amount of cellular volume and becoming more dilute as cells become larger. Whereas the ribosome, is roughly following cell volume um, for most of the range of bacteria. So you have almost a roughly constant concentration of ribosomes until you get to the very largest size where increasing growth rates and this um, larger volume of proteins requires an explosion in the number of ribosomes. And you get to a point where the ribosome can't replicate all of the, the ribosomes can't replicate all of the pool of ribosomes before the cell divides, and this is where you have more ribosomal volume than can actually fit inside the cell. And so looking at this plot as a whole, what we see is that at the small end of life, you tend to be running out of space for two of the components of the central dogma, namely proteins and uh, the DNA uh, storage information. And at the large end, you're also running out of space, this time for ribosomes. And so we think that simply looking at the central dogma, you can bound the smallest and largest possibilities for bacteria, and this might tell us something about early life. Well, how would it tell something about early life? Well, one experiment that we can perform is to say, imagine the ribosome was worse than the one that we have, or imagine that it was much better. So in this plot, the central solid line is our prediction for the required number of ribosomes in good agreement with data, which are the, the scatter points in the same plot. And what we see is that if the ribosome was 10 times faster at moving an mRNA strand and polymerizing an amino acid um, through it, then it 
would give bacteria an extra order of magnitude at the large end. They'd be able to get 10 times bigger um, than they are given the current ribosome limit. However, if the ribosome was 40 times slower, there would be no cell volume large enough to fit in all the ribosomes. You could never have a functional cell that encapsulates ribosomes. Um, and so this says that if early evolution, um, before encapsulation, say, had found ribosomes that were very slow, um, it wouldn't be able to encapsulate those. Um, what the ordering of those events are is still being worked out, um, but this is one perspective on what might be possible um, or impossible.